take your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 14. We'll be picking up in verse 1. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Lord, I pray that you'll take and uh, be with the services this morning. I pray that you'll take and uh, bless them. I pray that you'll take and uh, be with uh, each and every individual here. Help us to get what it is that you would have us to get out of your word. Help our hearts to be tender. Pray that you'll wash me now in your precious blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to teach the things that are in your word. Help and make it clear. And above all, I pray that you'll be honored and glorified from it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 14, I gave a little bit of an introduction on the uh, 144,000 last week. Now I want to just go into a little bit of detail with them, paying attention to some things about the 144,000 that we see this morning. And I looked in uh, verse 1, Revelation 14, 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now his father's name, that's the Lamb's father's name. That would be Jehovah. And take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 6. Check it, Exodus chapter 6 and look at verse 3. Now uh, the Jehovah Witnesses will hijack this verse and try to say that their first 144,000 were the 144,000 witnesses. And it's an obvious hijacking of the verse because for one, they weren't all males, and two, they weren't all virgins. And three, they did not come out of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So they just ignore everything about the 144,000 and take what they want and make up what they want to apply to themselves, which is what most people do when they teach a false doctrine and a cult out of the Word of God. They'll take and something from the Word of God and they'll run with it, totally disregarding everything the Bible says about it. And that's typical for a false religion. Take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 6 and look at verse 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Uh, that's a, also a verse that the Jehovah Witnesses ignore. Uh, if you want to have fun with the New World Translation, you go back and you can find where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all refer to God as Jehovah in the New World Translation because they can't stand the phrase the Lord because that's something that Jesus Christ is addressed as. So they try to do away with Lord in the Bible and they change every time the Lord shows up or God Almighty, or Almighty God, they change it to the name Jehovah. Well, then they go back before Exodus 6.3 and change Lord to Jehovah every time in the New World Translation. Well, you show them Exodus 6, 3, by my name Jehovah, was I not known to them? Well, if he wasn't known to them, why in the New World Translation are they calling him Jehovah? Shows that um, they're twisting the scripture for their own agenda. That is the most perverted translation out there with complete disregard for translating. Complete disregard. It's a very dishonest translation. It's one of the worst ones out there. Why? Because that thing was completely translated for their own agenda to fit their religion. That's why it was translated. I mean, the other ones came from corrupt texts. That one was corrupt as it was created. So that not only did it come from a corrupt text, the corrupt text was corrupted even more with the New World Translation. I don't understand how they can fall for it. I just don't get it. But they fall for it. And it shows that people are looking for a fellowship where they feel righteous and they feel religious, but this 
is not in their thoughts. They have no regard for it. And they do not want to be told by the Bible that they have been wrong. The Mormons are the same way. And there's no apology for that. What? You're talking Revelation 7 2? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, verse 3, it says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Yes, the seal is the Father's name. Yeah, that be huh? That be I believe it would be Jehovah. I, I know it's a little bit of a stretch, but you find a name that fits the Father. And Jehovah's going to be the name. Now you can use Lord Almighty, Lord God Almighty, but Jesus Christ is called Lord Almighty. Called the Almighty. He's even called the ever, Jesus Christ is even referred to as the Everlasting Father. In Isaiah... Uh, Exodus 6 3 is the best I can give you. That's the best I can give you. Uh, Jehovah, the name Jehovah will show up four times, I think, in the Bible, if I remember right. It only shows up four times. So, what, what you have in Revelation, um, if you look at 14 3, it says, uh, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay? So, it's the name of the father. It's the Lamb's Father's name. Okay? Yes? So, when, when God told Moses to tell the children of Israel, I am sent you, what, where does I am fit as far as a name for him? It's a title, and it's a title Jesus Christ claims for himself. Um, showing that him and the Father are one. So that type, that's why I wouldn't use that title. The only title I can find that is a name of the Father but doesn't apply to the Son or the Holy Ghost is Jehovah. Jesus Christ never claims the name Jehovah. You see what? Huh? He does claim I am. am. Yes. He claims that name. So that's where you're, uh, you're seeing the Trinity. You see the Son claiming the same titles that the Father claims. Lord, uh, the Godhead's name is, write this down, Godhead is the reference for the Trinity. Okay? So the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Lord, like this, now uh, you go get into the Hebrew spelling, what you have is Jehovah doesn't have any vowel points, neither does Lord, and it's spelled the same in Hebrew. So with that, when you take out, they wouldn't put the vowels in it in Hebrew, and they just had it memorized. So you go through the Old Testament, and it looks like the same name, but it's not because they're only putting the consonants in there, not, not putting the vowels. When you put the vowels in it, it was different names. It would be Jehovah or Lord. Cap, how many of you ever seen Lord capital L-O-R-D? Well, the reason they're given that title was that was Lord as Lord God Almighty. So you have a Lord. Now that title right there, you will find for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all referred to as Lord. That is the name of the Godhead. Lord God Almighty. So in Isaiah 
Jesus Christ in prophecy is referred to as the Almighty or the Everlasting Father. So that's not going to be the name of just the Father. The only name I can come up with that I know in Scripture that only applies to the Father and doesn't apply to the Son or the Holy Ghost is Jehovah. So that's how I come up with that. Now to, you say, could I be wrong? Yeah, I could be wrong. It doesn't say it right there in the Scripture that that is going to be the name. But that's how I come up with it. It's kind of a, it's kind of a what do they call it, deduction reasoning? <laughs> I mean, you kind of eliminate the others. So that's how I come up with that. And then uh, also what you see is, write this down. Every lie of false religion is based on a truth perverted. You'll find that principle time and time and time again. Every lie of false religion is based on a truth that's been perverted. So what's the lie? The Jehovah's Witnesses' name is a truth that's been perverted. You'll find that time and time. Uh, you'll find that many times with the Mormons, and you'll even find it with the Muslims. It's some truth somewhere that's been perverted or yanked out of context. Muslims have a lot of truth mixed into their religion, but it's just very perverted truth. They took it and twisted it to the wrong, the wrong way. You know what uh, the Muslims are doing? What have done? They tried to make Mohammed Moses and put everybody back under their own type of Mosaic law. And they are the conquerors coming into Palestine. So they're trying to claim what they want to be is the nation of Israel in the book of Joshua. Well, you look what the nation of Israel did to the inhabitants of Palestine in Joshua. Then you're going to realize how dangerous the Muslims are. And they look at you as the inhabitants of Palestine that needs to be wiped out. Now, was it true for Moses and for Joshua at that time? It was true at that time. But it's not true for Mohammed and the Muslims. Why? Because that's not God. So all the devil's doing with Mohammed and the Muslims is copycatting what God did with Israel back in the book of Joshua. It's the same thing. And they set up a certain amount of laws that they're very strict about to make them a peculiar people. Now, one of the things that... Uh, it was one of these Muslim countries, they initiated where women would beat other women if they were caught alone in a room with a man. They are beating them with a rod with adultery. And I was looking at posts. One, one of the posts was, well, that's the one thing I agree with the Muslims. How <laughs> somebody's post on it. Yet there is a certain amount of righteousness to that stuff. You know, under the Old Testament law, adultery, an uh, adulterer was put to be put to death. Who authorized that law? God did. Why? Because that showed what he thinks about adultery. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we look at it as something that's just common because it goes on so much in America because you have the freedom to sin willfully with no punishment. But that doesn't mean that God approves of it. And you start looking at the Mosaic Law when you actually look at what the children of Israel as a nation was under to make them a peculiar people. Well, I mean, they were as far out there as your Muslim laws. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, them Muslims, they're not as far crazy as you think they are. They're just stealing something that doesn't apply to them by the influence of the devil trying to copycat what God already did in the past. They're trying to become the nation of Israel. They're the devil's nation of Israel. That's what they are. What was the nation of Israel supposed to do in the Old Testament? They were supposed to influence the world to worship the God of Israel. That's what they were supposed to do. 
So what are the Muslims trying to do? They're trying to influence. How did they do it? They, how did God use the children of Israel to prove that God was with them through physical wars? Have you ever thought about that? Why well, isn't that what the Muslims are doing? It's a truth that's been perverted. It's a truth that's been perverted. Now, uh, there's some things with the Muslims that you know, Moses didn't sleep with no nine-year-old girl either, but <laughs> and kill his son-in-law so he could take his wife. <laughs> I mean, Moses was a righteous man that was me. Mohammed was a wicked, fornicating, child molesting murderer. Moses was just a murderer. He wasn't the other ones. <laughs> I mean, you know, Moses wasn't perfect. But boy, he was a whole lot better than Mohammed. Mohammed was a demon-possessed rascal. Yet they make him such a great man. There wasn't nothing great about Mohammed. And, and it's interesting to me, if you want to study um, the other side of the shadow of Mohammed, you know the character you come up with? A guy named Brigham Young. Well, boy, don't you let that one go out there. You study Brigham Young, he wasn't no innocent fella either. Now that was, how did I get off on that? <laughs> <laughs> Back to uh, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a th great thunder. And I heard a voice of harpers harping with their harps. Now here's a good verse to have in your back pocket if you ever deal with a group called the Church of Christ. You say, why? Because the Church of Christ believed that there is no use of musical instruments within the worship service. But where is this verse located? In verse 2. It's in heaven. And what are they doing? It's the voice of harping, harping with their harp. So the praising of the Lord is used with what? Harps. Do you know what a piano is? It's a harp. A harp is a stringed instrument. Uh, you say, well, that has keys. No, it has strings underneath the top plate. Then keys just control the strings. It's a harp. It's a type of harp. The Lord uses musical instruments, and so does the devil. You can tell which music is the Lord's and which music is the devil's by what the music is used for. And there will be types of music, and that music will be distinguished about what it does. Now, when you study the study of music, um, you have three types of music, basically, that's out there. You have music that glorifies God. That is heavenly music. That's good music. You have music that glorifies the flesh. That's carnal music, fleshly music. Some of it may not necessarily be a sinful music. It's just music that the flesh likes. I would category one of my favorite types of music as part of a fleshly music, and that's bluegrass. I mean, it gets you go. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't not necessarily consider it always carnal. Some of it is. You got to be careful with it. But uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's heavenly music either. It's more southern music. I mean, then you have um, the evil music. So you got fleshly, you got satanic music, you got heavenly music, and you got fleshly music. And that fleshly music can be sometimes a little bit more on the satanic or a little bit more on the heavenly. And you gotta be careful with the fleshly music. All right, now let me show them to you. When it first of all, when it comes to godly music, notice how. Musical instruments are used many times to praise the Lord. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. So uh, if you want to take and uh, waste your time arguing with the Church of Christ, which they uh, reasoning 
from my experience, do not belong with the Church of Christ, so it is somewhat of a waste of time. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and look at verse 23. 16:23, And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hands, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So what did that music that David did do? The devil does not like God's music, and God does not like the devil's music. There is a difference between the two. There's a difference. Now, if you take the devil's music and you put Christian words to it, it's still the devil's music. The words do not change it. It's the type of music. Music, write this down. Music is a universal language. It's a universal language. It speaks to the soul and the spirit. It's a different voice. It's a different language. It speaks to the soul and the spirit. Music will move the spirit and the soul. It also moves evil spirits or the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Look at verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with psaltery and tabret and pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, so where's the Spirit of the Lord hanging around? With a bunch of prophets playing music. And it comes upon Saul. So the Spirit of the Lord is associated with these prophets playing music. And an evil spirit doesn't like the music and will flee from it. So there's a certain type of music that the Lord likes and he is in. And there's a certain type that the devil likes and he's in. Now, take your uh, Bible and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 3. 1 Chronicles chapter 25. Look at verse 3. Well, notice um, in verse 2 a certain name, the sons of Asaph. Uh, if you go through the Psalms, you'll see that name, a, a Psalm of Asaph. Not all the Psalms were written by David. A lot of them were written by Asaph. Now, Look at verse 3. Of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun, Gadaliah, and Zariah, and Josiah, Hashbiah, and Mattathiah, 600, the hands of their fathers, Jeduthun, who prophesied with a what? Harp. And give thanks and praise and to praise the Lord. So they use a harp to prophesy and praise the Lord. You know how much prophecy is through those psalms that Asaph writes? The Psalms. You say that's that's what they're talking about is them Psalms that you're reading. And they're prophesying and they're playing it to a harp. The Lord likes music, but it has to be the right kind of music. It's godly music. There is a kind of music that's not godly, it's satanic. Alright, take your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter thirty three. Psalms chapter thirty three. Psalms chapter thirty three, verse two. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery, and an instrument of ten strings, sing unto him a new song, play, play skillfully with a loud noise. You know, God's an author of music being used in the worship service. It just needs to be God honoring music. Don't ever get upset because somebody wants to use an instrument the right way. Uh, the Church of Christ are way off on that. They're way off. Look at Psalms 150. Psalms 150. Look at verse 3. Psalms 150, verse 3. Praise Him with the sound of... Here you two go. The sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. 
So can you use the trumpet the right way? Absolutely. Absolutely. The walls of Jericho fell down with the blast of the trumpet. So uh, those instruments can be used of God to glorify God, to honor God, and to praise God. It's nice to have good music around the house playing. You know why? Because devils don't like good music. If you think there's a devil messing around with your house and your family, I'll give you two things to do. Open up that Bible and start reading it aloud and play good music in your house. Why? Well, if that devil's going to hang around, you can make him awful uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, that's, those are the two things you use, though. Those two things. Now, there's a different type of music that is not associated with the Lord. Now, music can be used both ways. There's both. Uh, who was one of the greatest musicians of the universe? Lucifer. Lucifer. He had pipes and tabrets built within his wings. He was a musician. So uh, there's a type of the music that he's going to use to get praise. There's also a type that the flesh uses. Now, take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. This one will be fleshly music. We hear this one in the bars, the dance halls, and the dives. Okay, and the gathering joints. This is fleshly music. Isaiah chapter 5. And look at Isaiah chapter 5 and pick up verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine has inflamed them. Now look what happens once they're drunk. Verse 12. And the harp and the vial and the tra tabernacle and the pipe and, the, and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. In other words, they're playing music and they're playing it to their enjoyment while they're enjoying their strong drink and their alcohol. Does that sound like anything that's changed today? You go into any place with heavy alcohol, there will always be music blaring. But it's a different type of music. It's carnal. You know what they sing about most of the time? Well, if you play it backwards, you get your dog back, you get your wife back, you get your car back, you quit fornicating. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> it's fleshly music. It's fleshly music. You know, some of the... The older you go, the little bit more cleaner it was. You know, it goes downhill as time goes by. Now, the farther back you go, the little bit more cleaner it was. But man, you, you still, you can still tell it was fleshly music. Why? Because they just sung about stuff of the flesh. We call some of it folklore. And the farther back you get, the more you get toward what's called bluegrass. You realize in bluegrass, somebody dies every time. In most bluegrass, somebody dies. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a bemoaning. When you actually listen to what they're singing about, it's a little bemoaning. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a sad music. Now, if it's just the music, it's, what does it appeal to? It appeals to the flesh. It's a, more of a fleshly music. I wouldn't necessarily always call it a sinful music, but I would say it's not really a God-glorifying music. Now, some of it you can use and you can sing hymns too and use it to glorify God. But, I mean, there's a difference. I mean, there's a difference between a choir, a classical choir and a bluegrass band. That classical choir seems to lift the spirit a little higher than the bluegrass band does. Now the bluegrass band may make the southerner run the bases a little bit more, but I mean that gets in the leg, you know. And uh, you, you got to recognize the two. There is also a music associated with idolatry. Look in Exodus chapter 32. 
Now this would be considered devilish music. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And pick up verse 17. Exodus 32, 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. Now, what happened? Well, uh, late earlier in the chapter, you see they rise up to play and dance before the two golden calves. Let's see, um, verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to what? Play. So they're playing before these idols. And, it's, and when Joshua, hearing it up on the camp, he says, it's the sound of war. Have you ever heard heavy metal? Where heavy metal started out, uh, rock and roll starts out with, um, it's a fornication that's associated with devil, with devilish music. That's what rock and roll is. And you get into the heavy metal rock and roll, where it's just satanic, that thing has a certain sound. And that sound, it just racks your nerves. That's a satanic music. Now if you take that music, now here's one, rap. Rap is satanic. You say, how do you know? Well, what's associated with rap? Killing, violence, cussing, cursing, it's all associated. You say, well, it's Christian rap. There ain't no such thing. There's no such thing. It's a war. It's the sound of war. Um, here's a quote by Fanny Crosby. The words of the Lord should never be sung to the music of the world. And I would have to agree with Fanny Crosby on that. Should never be sung to the music of the world. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 5. What do you have with the image of that Nebuchadnezzar sets up? Here's idolatry. You have all types of music. Now they're using the same instruments, but they're using it for a different purpose. You can take the same instrument and play it the wrong way for a different purpose. Now, there's also a sensual music. Look at Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23. And pick up verse 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king. After the end of seventy years shall Tyre seem as an what? Harlot. Take and harp, go about the city, thou harlot, that hast been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. So here's the music and song of a harlot. You say, what is that? That's a sensual music. There's certain music that's sensual. In other words, it's to arouse a person. Every fornicator knows about that music. Everyone. Oh, they're going to take her out and they're going to romance her. They're going to play sensual music. Certain music is fleshly and sensual. You say, well, how do I know which music it is? It speaks to to the spirit. What does the music arouse? What does the music make you want to do? Does it want to say, do you want to say glory to God when you hear it? No. Well then what does it make you want to do? Music is an unspoken language. It does speak to you. So which one does it say? Not all music is good music. You know, sometimes you just got to turn it off. Turn it off. If it's the wrong type of music. Years ago when I was a young man, I'll close with this. I took a gal out one time that played.
played in the church, played the piano in the church, and she played real good. There was only one date with this gal, and it was over. And I never could figure it out why until I got older, then I remembered something I had said to her. She liked Elvis Presley. And I told her, you do realize Elvis Presley was a dope-headed, fornicating bum, right? And I had said that on our date. And I didn't think nothing of it, because it was just a fact. She never wanted to go out with me again. <laughs> you know? You may have music that your flesh liked, but what is the results that produced in the singer? Oh, I like Willie Nelson. What was Willie Nelson? Uh, here, here's a guy at work. Uh, Willie Nelson's playing Seven Spanish Angels on the. He goes, That's a godly song. You ought to play that in your church when people come in. I just cracked up laughing. I was like, You lost your mind? <laughs> he goes, Oh, that's a good song. That's godly music. I'm sitting there thinking, Boy, you need to learn what godly music is. <laughs> I mean, that's, that guy was fleshly. He wanted to, you know, most country music singers, they, a lot of them are deists. And they believe in God and they like to sing about God. But their music isn't godly music, it's fleshly music. But they want to, because they want to be recognized as being godly, they'll put some godly words to it. Sometimes. And you, you know, you got to understand the balance there. Just because they're mentioning God does not make them godly. Just because you take the devil's music and you put words of God to it does not make it godly. It's still the devil music. So there's three musics. There's godly, there's fleshly, and then there is devilish music. Those are your three types of music. All right, well... I did not know that that would take the whole Sunday school lesson, but we will stop there. Now you have been taught about music.